And so I get a lot of 20 year olds, 19, 20 year olds coming around and talking about um, how do we make food for communities? How do we have control over it? How do we make sure it's healthy? How do we know it has all this impact on landscape and climate? And it comes back to this, uh, how do we repopulate it as an occupation thing? And I say, you know, what are, you're 20, I'm 70, 50 years between us, which is a working life, okay? You're embarking, I'm departing. What would be reasonable things for you standing here 20 years old today to aspire for the world, the community, when you're 70, what's a reasonable ask? This comes back to the, could we get 15% of y'all doing it full-time as a profession, not occasionally paying attention to it, but doing it full-time as a profession? Because when you work in things, you know things about them that you can't get any other way. Welcome to The Real Organic Podcast. I'm Lindley Dixon, co-director of The Real Organic Project. We're a grassroots, farmer-led movement with an add-on organic food label, distinguishing organic crops grown in healthy soils and organic livestock raised on well-managed pasture. You just heard from Carl Hammer, longtime organic pioneer and owner of the revered Vermont Compost Company. I see that Fort V potting soil all over the country when I inspect farms for The Real Organic Project. Carl has a brilliant, often wandering mind that I never tire of hearing from. Carl has been a longtime friend and neighboring farmer to my co-director, Dave Chapman, who sat down with him on his porch for this conversation. So welcome to the Real Organic Podcast. And today I'm talking with an old friend, Carl Hammer. And um, we could have a very long introduction, but I do very short introductions. So I'll just say that, that Carl uh, created and still runs the Vermont Compost Company, and one of many things that he has done in his life, but it's the thing that more people have heard about. And Carl, I'd like to talk about some compost, but, but first I have some other things that, that I wanted to talk about. I, I want to you know we're we're having the symposium coming up in January and we're going to we're going to ask two questions and the first question is um, is organic regenerative and the second question is is regenerative organic and we're doing this because people are so confused about those two questions and i get anguished letters on a regular basis asking those questions so welcome and i'm curious to dive in you know yeah Let, let's yeah. start with the first one it is is, is in organic, your world in can, your mind is organic regenerative um and and i think the answer is sometimes good potentially uh uh not always or especially, I mean, defining for a moment, organic meaning certified organic compliant with the NOP. Well, I, I won't take that as a given. You can decide that. Yeah. I, I think that you and I both had a definition for organic that long preceded the National Organic Program. Yes. yes. So if you have a definition that is different or exceeds that, I'd like to hear it. Well, um, definition might be too strong a word. Yeah, coming at the evolution of the term and uh, and w w when you and i started using the term and we were directly in the recent influence of the 1973 efoam promulgation and standards we were we were uh involved in a a conversation that had become a, a, a literally a global conversation uh around the term organic it was prior to to any um, official government involvement in the term uh, by quite a bit and um, we this was uh, we understood some things about the, the foundational principle one of which was that that organic was about a a movement in 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 a direction of practice we were 
organic was supposed to be moving towards some practice aspirations that would mitigate the damage that we all understood industrial and chemical agriculture were were wreaking um, and uh, so and and in those days early on the, the, we had a lot of conversations about the ethical edges the ethical parts of this so did did labor did did labor equity figured um, and uh, people answered differently actually uh, people said no this is about whether whether there's the you know the, the that whether there is the presence of pesticides and very early in a lot of these conversations we we had folks coming at it the i remember mothers and others for pesticide limits and for a lot of us it's like yeah organic sure we give up the toxic pesticides we understand that but that's not that was what we used to call organic by neglect uh, organic by elimination the organic was not to be re merely substitution of non-toxic inputs for for potentially toxic inputs and and this was all around at the time a discussion about whether as some people said nitrogen is nitrogen which is really not actually that that's not that's not a very good description of nitrogen in the dynamics of agriculture at all 78 percent of the air is elemental nitrogen uh, which figured too so uh, that early concept of organic was absolutely regenerative uh, in terms of its aspirations. We were all about increasing the, the residential carbon in soils. That was already a discussion. Not so much at that point in 63, even though, well, we knew about CO2 rising in 73. Uh, but, and we knew about the, 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 the from, even earlier, from from 1960, Rachel Carson publishing, I mean, which pushed a lot of, well, that's where my father got inspired about, I mean, it was one of the sources, was Rachel Carson in 1960. It was a big deal. Uh, uh, to, to really start to think about farming and its impact and start to understand the acreage involved on, in terms of the land mass of the planet. Um, and we were already... Uh, starting to my my dad died in 69 we were already talking about the climate events that were starting to be understood or uh, or measured um so the, i i would say that and 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 you know we we started talking about the definition of organic then there's the definition of regenerative let's put that well, off just for a minute yep, okay because i'd really like to understand this this is a a big deal one of one of the things well, the first person that I know of who used the term regenerative was Bob Rodale. Yep. And and he was not talking about, as far as I know, something less than organic or more chemicals. He was talking about organic returning to those earlier social roots, I think, of social engagement of... Um, yeah, soil and society. Soil and society. Yeah, could you talk about that? Yeah, so... Um, and And... Within the mainstream, at the point in when, when, uh, when the Soil Conservation Service was was founded, and the coming out of the Dust Bowl era, and Henry Wallace as as Secretary of Agriculture, and in in literature culminating in the 1948 Yearbook of Agriculture, Men and Soil, um, which where the Secretary of Agriculture in the United States in writing his foreword said, 80 years of European management of the soil, or 100 years, whatever it was at that moment, I think, yeah. Uh, and we have destroyed the fertility that was, was here, okay? Uh, so the, the, it was understood that, that, the, that the, the practices of the European farmers that showed up on this continent had very quickly um, damaged the the fertility that that they found when they headed west across that prairie. Um, so, and that that was basically pre chemical. I mean, not entirely. That was pre. That was not entirely, but it was before chemical. Remember, it was the nineteenth century where we. Where the where fertil global fertilizer trade started with the harvesting of the 
ancient guano resources of the Atacama Desert, okay? And the biggest sailing ships that world, the world had ever built were steel-hulled ships that slowly went from Chile to Europe. And basically, the British and the Germans were ready to fight wars over the supply of, of the, the um, Chilean nitrate, uh, which changed the agriculture of Europe. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, um, and 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 changed it how? Well, it became possible. They, I mean, the the first surge of that, and th this goes to the father of chemical agriculture, who you know, Justus von Liebig, who had discovered the, who promulgated the theory of the limiting element, and uh, and nitrogen was frequently that and. Um, it, it, by the way, we know that Eustace von Liebig, before he died, recanted of the chemical theory. But by then he was an old man and there was an industry. And everybody said, eh. Because he, he went on to say, but wait a minute, if you do this for long enough, now we've proved in research stations that your, your yields drop off when you deplete the humus. And humus was still one of those not fully defined, so this is before we knew about glomalin or glomalin and, uh, and, and so, but much had been written about humus and tilth since people wrote. I mean, the learned physician in Almeria in the 13th century writing about soils and depletion of soils, uh, civilizations had fallen and people had understood it was in the, in the, um, in, in Sanskrit tomes, from 1500 and more years ago, uh, what, 4,500 years ago, were the first warnings in Sanskrit about husbanding soil resources. So this, this has actually happened to people many times. We know this, that they have destroyed the soil upon which they depended for sustenance by uh, bad management. And typically that bad management was um, uh, motivated by the desire to take more than the system could give and sustain itself, uh, which is some of what informs the concept of regenerative, uh, that you have, so you have a balance, you have some amount of sunshine that falls on any piece of land. And then you have a set of potentials a photo, for photosynthesis, which is ultimately the limit, the photosynthetic potential. It's how much sunshine falls on a piece of land, and then, then the other limitations. And, you know, in soil science, crudely, we now recognize 39 primary horizons globally. Every soil, every pedon, as they call it in soil science, would, um, has is one of 39. Now that's a gross, gross taxonomic oversimplification. Obviously, there are millions of soils. But of the 39, and again, this is current soil science, Soil Science Society Encyclopedia, 12 are considered potentially, it's so optimal that they're potentially self-organizing. And that leaves What's 20. What does that mean, self organized Well, that they can achieve this maximum photosynthetic potential by just being themselves, the things that will grow and the successions that will happen. And so that leaves 27 horizons that, um, that could use some amending to, to, to achieve their, the, the possibility of the sunshine falling on them. All right, so let me go back just for a second. I, I hear you, but um, but question. Uh, you said that civilizations fell because of the way the soil was managed. How was the soil managed in a way that was unskillful, that made it uh, not sustainable? And, okay, so in the case of, uh, let's say, the Tigris-Euphrates, um, they actually developed very sophisticated irrigation systems that ultimately um, um, failed to, because the, well, they, they ended up with a lot of salt, okay? They, they literally irrigated themselves into, uh, into collapse. Not uh, because they ran out of water, but because, because the water was too salty. Because, and, and also the, 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 
because the grades, they, they ended up with the rivers getting higher and higher. I mean, they had, they had a lot of engineering problems that, that challenged them in the Tigris Euphrates. Um, the, the Romans monocropped wheat until the Fertile Crescent blew away. And they did that to project, wheat was great for projecting military power because you can carry a lot of it. And uh, you can, again, you, you start growing it with slaves, you invent, you improve the tillage actually. They, they, they developed horse collars, uh, we, which really changed how many people were required to. I didn't know that they yeah, had horse was, collars. Yeah, yeah the Romans, the Romans uh, stopped choking their horses <laughs> and that really improved the yields. Uh, um, and and some of this this soil mismanagement a lot of our what we think of as political science ties in to this okay so uh, the the roman the change from a republic to uh the early romans could not own they they developed the, the concept of latifundia of of too few people owning too much land and they understood that to be inherently uh, destabilizing, inimical to republic, uh, which is a conversation we're having today, though we've gotten really confused because we have so many other forms of wealth other than land now, uh, which, you know, we, that are very abstract, whereas land is many things, but it's not an abstraction. Uh, so the places that sunshine falls, there's only so much of that. Uh, cryptocurrency, there's no there's no limit. Uh, currencies generally, money is an abstraction with no direct caloric value, which again, you know, I don't know who I was talking with lately, remembering Ralph Borsodi and all the Exeter, you know, the, all those people in New Hampshire in the 30s who, who developed a currency based on a basket of actual agricultural commodities mm -hmm. and that, you know, so that they're, you know, redeemable in corn and wheat and, and uh, uh, that five acres enough the uh, Exeter project, you remember? I remember. I but, mean, it, this, but, the nearings were part of that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So let me let me Sorry, ask. Let me weeds. jump in. Let me jump yeah, in. Yeah, jump in. So, okay, we see that some civilizations uh, were were collapsing. It's interesting in the case of Rome. Yes, the soil wore out, and it, it partly it was this shift from small farmers to slave labor to plantations. Yeah, to latifundia. Right, owned by. A f small number of rich people. And frequently absent. Frequently absent. It sounds a great deal like California right now. Well, and, and Latifundia have been, you know, Southern Andalusia was a Latifundia. The French established Latifundia. In Could the, you translate Latifundia for Latifundia, us? Latifundia. Um, uh, well, it's obviously Latin. Uh, um, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm losing the, I don't have the Latin right now. To, um, but it is, a, it, it is a political science term of art in Roman political science uh, and and this uh, it's the loss of the small holder yes it's the it's the consolidation of land to it's it's defined as too much land owned by too few people okay uh, and if you look at Vermont as a microcosm of the world at the moment an enormous percentage of its rated tillage is now farmed literally by 31 families 31 LFOs, large farm operations, are, are farming coming 75% of the rated tillage in the state. A responsibility that, you know, boggles the mind. And it's also one that um, most people don't know about. Drive around, there's a cornfield, there's a hay field. That, it's the, that these have been changing ownership at an extraordinary rate, right, in the last mm -hmm. decade, especially, and, and further consolidation coming. Uh, and some of those folks, uh, well, your neighbor there, Walter, says, well, at some point the society has to deal with us. Which, you know, in this conversation I said to Walter, I said, yeah, well, tip, one of the typical ways it ends up being dealt with is some of the latifundists end up hanging upside down with their, their hides dangling around their ears and some get away. Uh, is how it has historically mostly ended. You know, one could hope that there would be a uh, 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 a, a m much less violent <laughs> resolution to the current consolidation. But the current consolidation should be worrisome. Any Roman political science would think that this is a dangerous condition we're, we're in. Okay, so excellent. And that would be part of that 
social meaning to what organic meant. I think it, it was trying to address that among many things. But let's go back just for a minute to um, the idea that the, the fertile soil of America was destroyed in that 100-year period. And my question was, why was it destroyed? What, what about the practices were destructive? And at that point, I would say probably not primarily latifundia. So it was probably about what were the, I mean, some of it was for well, sure. Was the South. Cons- oh, yeah, and, I guess and that was, there was they, And remember, King Carlos III gave a jackass to George Washington because he knew that the Americans were going to be doing plantation agriculture. And you have to have mules. Slaves are always expensive. So you empower slaves, slave owners empower their slaves with mules. And no other animal will do if you're doing indigo, sugar, cotton. Um, because oxen are slow and, 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 and horses can't take the heat and mules are what, so the Spanish and French, and for whatever reason, the Anglos were never mule people. Okay. The English just didn't do that, but they did sometimes. They, they had donkeys in their mines, the coal mines, the Welsh, the Irish, but they didn't do the mule thing. And they also didn't really, initially, they were not the first ones on doing cotton, sugar, or indigo either with slaves. They came, the English actually came to a lot of that somewhat later than the, um, and the Spanish, of course, had all of that influence from, from Moorish culture that the English didn't really have, which is how the, the, the donkey and mule thing progressed from the Nile. Okay. We could talk a long time about donkeys and mules, but I yeah. still want to go back to... I wanted to get to 40 acres and a mule just for okay, a brief thing. Okay, we're... we're Okay, you want to do that now? Uh, well, I'll throw it in at this okay. minute, because r- remember the plantation stuff, cotton stuff, sugar stuff, was evolved to a science by the time of the American Revolution, by by the French, by the by the English. I mean, well, the English and the Spanish. About so, forty acres and a mule was a piece of agronomic arithmetic by Reconstruction, when three and a half me- million people were emancipated. It was understood that the family unit, a, 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 a slave family unit, could manage 40 acres with a mule. And that was the arithmetic. And that was how many mules you needed to empower your slaves to give you good economic return. Um, at the moment of emancipation, that was three and a half million highly skilled farmers that were supposed to get 40 acres and a mule. Okay, which is still, we still, we need that, but it would have been much more efficient then to do it. Lincoln hadn't been killed, et cetera, et cetera. The 40 acre and a mule promise had been kept. We would be living actually in a very different United States yeah. in terms of, uh, and okay, how did they destroy all that? Well, one of the things that happened is that many Europe immigrants were brought here under poltroon systems basically even so like the New York the Hudson Valley it was all given by European monarchs to entrepreneurs who then settled it with landless peasants from Europe uh, and put them into a a feudal condition Uh, then you had resistors to that concept so Jefferson comes along and says no We want yeomanry, we want freehold, we want, because freeholds are the only way to have a stable republic, uh, that you need, you need smallholders who own their holding. Which Uh, is reflecting that early Roman ideal for the republic as well. Yes, no more than five Roman acres. Roman acre was a hectare. It's what, you know, it was hard to own more, it was not legal to own more than 12 acres in the republic early, okay? And, uh, and that was the understanding that this would develop a, a solar receiving fabric of society that would, uh, uh, that would be a, a, a egalitarian by rule. Sure, some people would be clever or get more, may, you know, work harder perhaps, but basically everybody would, would have a very similar holding uh, and that that would be stable and, and a very effective way to harvest sunshine for sustenance, which was the and sustainable in the sense that the that they would have every incentive not to be extracting more than their land could provide and roman law had in in 
parallel, right next to fee simple ownership of premises, a separate ownership of the usufruct. Usufruct meaning the useful fruit, what could be grown. And properties were, had as part of their assessment, how many jars of wine, jars of oil, baskets of grain, um, and all of the supporting crops like oozers to make those baskets to keep the grain and uh, and uh, the potential to to a, a, a clay for brick and vessel making were all part of the assessment and those those parts that could be grown every year were could be separately owned the use of fruit was the solar income and it could be owned separate from the fee simple um, which progressed through British law a bit there are usufruct rights in English law. By the time we get to American property law, the word is gone, usufruct is gone. And a lot of effort goes into restricting how long a lease can be. So 99 years in America is about as, is how long a land lease can be. It can't be longer and be a true lease in most venues and most circumstances. Now, some of this comes around again, the overthrow of the Mexican latifundia was the ejido. The 1910 revolution established the ejido, which was a, a right to tillage, a usufruct right that initially could not be conveyed it, except to heirs. It could not be sold. You could not give up your right except to an heir, um, a, an ejido right. And a lot of games got played uh, to, to, to disenfranchise the ejidos. Um, uh, so, the, it, okay, I'm sorry. Back to America for yep, a minute. Yep. So, and and I, you do get to edit this, of course. <laughs> oh, I have no intention of editing. Oh. So, so to look at the at the um, at that yearbook of men and soil. Yep. And and they were saying Wallace was saying we got a big problem. Wallace yep. and the USDA. Yep. Were saying we got a big problem that we're destroying our soils right all right we look at the south and we see yes there'd been a a, a long-term latifundia plantation culture monocropping of cotton monocrop of cotton tobacco enslaved people absentee landlords so so um and and that soil was very degraded yes um do you think that over tillage was a significant part of that degradation Tillage was part of the degradation. Tillage in pursuit of over extraction, over demanding production and without providing mitigation. So, you know, arable takes, and this was mostly arable uh, sod. So there was no, there was no regeneration of the soil. It, There's no, we, no green manuring. Right. No, no cover cropping. Yeah, none of the none of those practices, and and uh, the balance. Uh, while there was always livestock, because there was no, you know, the livestock provided power. I mean, tractors really accelerated the opportunity to destroy soil, uh, uh, but they didn't. They were didn't originate it, and people had destroyed soil in many places before. Some people were exempted, notably the Egyptians, because until they dammed Aswan. No matter how badly they acted, all of Assyria was coming down and flowing out onto the, you know. So, uh, and then they they were they had they got other people's topsoil deposited on their land. Yes, yes, yeah. and uh, you know, uh, just and, to make clear for people. yeah, 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 that that that, that uh, and there was over there was poor husbandry in Assyria that accelerated all of that. You know, overgrazing of goats. I mean, there was they were local overpopulations. Greece endured that. Um, uh, where they were, they were just, I mean, you can, you can destroy soil with almost any type of agriculture you care to name if you, if you do it too extractively, because uh, there are limits to what the soil can tolerate about extraction. And, and so in the, in the, in the Midwest, there was also a problem. I mean the dust bowl. Yeah, it blew away. Yeah, it blew but, away. And that, and of course, those were, those were fra again, those were, those were Aeolian soils. Okay, they had come by wind. 
And mm -hmm. so the people who lived there, the, the, the prairie indigenous people, when they first saw people like exposing soil, they said, well, you're crazy. They knew when, when for whatever reason, a buffalo stampede exposed soil, it blew because these soils had come on the wind. They were, so soils are all formed somehow. And this, this comes back to a conversation we had to talk about doing this, where, where you know, we were talking about the no-till aspiration and talking about, I, I have felt since I first heard about no-till that it, it was a, a, a bad way to express the set of practice aspirations we should have or aspire, uh, that appropriate till, ethical till, only when needed till. There, the concept is even, well, everything is tilled somewhere, somehow. It got there somehow. So in, around here, we know that 15,000 years ago, pretty much everything got tumbled around by the glaciers. Not every, and then subsequent, subsequent alluviations, our best soils are alluviated glacial tills here. But, and even if it's 15,000 years ago, and maybe it laid itself out perfect, and you don't need ever again to till it. It had a primary tillage that was so great, certain kinds of Hadley silt river bench might be a good example, that yeah, you probably shouldn't necessarily need to plow it again. I don't know if that's true, but in many, many circumstances, it is not, you cannot achieve the photosynthetic potential to, to without some form of shape change. Uh, and in many, I think there are many circumstances where tillage can enhance the regeneration of soil. Uh, and so, you know, that obviously would be, a, could be a pretty interesting argument to get into some, with some folks, right? Uh, right. We talked about the moldboard plow. And we also, this comes back to the social because uh, what are the tools that, a, if, we, if we're to repopulate the harvest direct solar harvest of sustenance, if we think it's works that one of the, one of the challenges in a in a society and especially perhaps in a if you, in a democracy, this town we're sitting in East Montpelier, in 1940, 200 families shipped milk in cans. There are two. There's one big organic dairy, one very big conventional dairy, and my neighbor here, Gary Butler, still milking 27 Guernseys in the same stanchions that his grandfather put in. Uh, and as Gary says, he's gonna keep milking those 27 Guernseys till they find him dead and then everybody can fight about it. But, you know, uh, so that's what's left. Now, okay, how about a town meeting? Let's talk about the collective agricultural intelligence represented at town meeting today. Gary doesn't actually go. Uh, the halls probably, you know, some, yeah. Uh, the the organic farmer is the head selectman, so he goes. But compare to a mere 1940s, not that long ago, how much people actually knew about the crops, the soil, the... Uh, so if, if for no other reason that it's the work of harvesting sunshine for sustenance seems to me to be too important to have so few people doing it and knowing about it for because it's you know i mean i've been worried about this uh, since it occurred to me there's been a long concern of mine about about how about a society that has six tenths of its six tenths of one percent of the labor force actually directly producing food and most of those people with no ownership in the means of production so it is now a, a tiny, tiny portion. Whereas this country, at, you know, when Jefferson was president, most people, that's what they did. In Vermont and before the First World War, 90% of the labor force were actively harvesting off land. Uh, and so this is, a, this is a very rapid social change we've had uh, in, in, this, in historical terms. Uh, and, uh, well, w I, you know, I, I think we should all be very uh, concerned about it. Um, and, and this ties to the, this question of organic and regenerative, because farmers who, who, without the right equity relationship to the land, 
the classic tenant have mostly damaged the land because the boss, the landlord is demanding more all the time and he's elsewhere and the only way to get more is to beat it a little harder and so uh, the agriculture becomes primary, very extractive. Uh, and uh, it's, this has been repeated many times in, in the history of agriculture and written about very competently by many. Um, Hyams wrote about it pretty well. Yes, he did. Uh, uh, and and um, Cato wrote about it already by in, in Roman times. Uh, so it, it, we we are we repeat it now with the particular, you know, capitalist syngenta twist. I mean, you know, it it is known that well we're in a very odd moment. You know, Iowa corn ground right now is selling for thirty thousand dollars an acre, and not to people living in Iowa mostly, although mm. sometimes it's farms buying farms. Uh, so it, it's understood globally that food is in some sense important. Uh, uh, and the, I, I think it's hard to untangle organic or regenerative from the equity questions in the society because the, the equity issues have so much impact on the practice. So your your understanding or your vision of a a positive agriculture of an agriculture that you go that's a good idea would be to have many small holders yes many i mean i'm i'm find myself in the sort of in the trite condition of yeah they should have reading writing and arithmetic <laughs> so that they can inform the you know, if you look at how, at, at what the, how the Department of Agriculture came about, it was first a publishing venture. They published two books, the Yearbook of Patents and the Yearbook of Agriculture. Before there was a Department of Agriculture, it was a part of the... It, 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 well, the, the, the early... After the United States was founded, the patents and agriculture were the same department, okay? And they published those two books. And the, the Yearbook of Agriculture was mostly a compendium of letters from farmers all over the United States who wrote well because they'd gone to little schoolhouses where they split wood and hauled water and the teacher got to sleep. You know, I mean, the, the, the food was made in the society. Vermont was a food exporter until uh, just recently, really, and could sustain itself comfortably. In 1900, Vermont could sustain itself comfortably without importing things. I mean, there were enough calories being produced and everybody knew how to do it. And there were plenty of, the work was getting done. And if you look at the food that rolled down out of these hills to the train station to go to the, the, the men at war in the Second World War, you look at 1943 newspaper and there's, in all the local newspapers, there's a section about the potatoes showing up at Montpelier Junction to go to Europe to feed the boys. Uh, so the, 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 the skill set all over America to do this was completely available. Uh, we're in a very different circumstance right now if we want to, uh, you know, what's a reasonable and plausible ask? Uh, what would be a good idea? Could we get to 15% of our population feeding the other 85% in 40 years? Technically, certainly, okay? And that would be every seventh household is full-time professional farmers. Is that a, but we don't know exactly what the reasonable number. Historical numbers in this agricultural societies are anywhere from half of everybody doing it full-time as a job to quite a bit more than half of everybody doing full-time as a job. And now we're less than 1%. So we're, uh, and, and, you know, then the question that you might want to follow with is, well, all right, given where we're at, can we really have regenerative organic agriculture at, at that scale with the current equity situation where Bill Gates is said to be the largest landowner in the United States now, 200, whatever it is, 70, I don't know how much land I forget. It didn't, it's so big a number, it didn't stick with me. Um, so, um, and can how, and how would we how would how how would we get a pri this to be the kind of priority? All right, when we have extreme priority, we have a draft. We go to war. We want to send people off 
to do something really dangerous and unpleasant, we can marshal millions and millions and do it when we feel we need to, right? Uh, is this emergency as important as, say, the Nazi uh, invasions of, of Poland? Um, well, it starts to look like it, no? Well, I don't think very many people agree with you. I don't think that this is perceived as a national crisis, the ownership of land. I... I agree with you, but, but, you know, I don't think that whereas it's fairly obvious when somebody's bombing you that that's a crisis. Yeah. And um, we do have other crises that I think, I think it's now becoming believed on a, on a fairly large scale that agriculture is very impactful on climate change. And I believe it's pretty widely accepted now that climate change is a crisis. Yeah. So there's a conversation that people are ready to have if what you're saying is, well, this is going to address climate change in, in, in some significant way. Then I yeah, think well, if you we, say, well, land ownership has to do with that. So go ahead. Well, I'm, I'm, uh, 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 the, the, the question about equity comes up when some people don't, are, aren't getting food. I mean, that, that's very destabilizing. Uh, now, there, there would be honest people who would say, well, we can do big and we can do corporate and we can do it. We have the technology and the science to do it in such a way that we improve soil health. Um, <laughs> now, uh, maybe, maybe. Uh, or so, so there's a debate going on now. And again, as I say, I get a lot of people asking me about it. Um, and and there's a thing that's become mm, a, a religious belief that all tillage is bad. And I have very smart and well-meaning people who absolutely believe that, who talk to me. They believe, Even like Grelinette? Yes. They believe that, that putting a shovel in the ground... Even copper clad? <laughs> I don't know. How about silver? <laughs> So, so this is the the thing is there there are some farmers who believe that, but more it's it's eaters, and they there there's a lot of conversation going on. I believe a lot of that conversation is funded by corporations at this point, and they they're they're putting out a thing. And I think the reason that it's become a, a article of faith is because a lot of money is being made by big companies that involve a lot of herbicide. Right, because no-till is was always about herbicide. Always about herbicide. Yeah, well, except you know crimping and yes. Well, they're they're now things being. I I have a crimper. Do you have a crimper? I have no. a crimper. I love my crimper. You, I, I hear a lot of bad news about crimpers from farmers too. They're going. It didn't work. It didn't for work. Me. Oh well, that's not exactly bad news. <laughs> we do all kinds of things that don't work. <laughs> you want to get your GIAs knocked down? It crimp them. Only a certain kind of person would have JAs in their life anyway, right? Uh, but I'm, I've been doing crimping in pasture, and it is a very interesting tool, uh, and it has a place. No, it doesn't always work, in, and it was especially challenging in Vermont, actually, because it works better in Pennsylvania, I think, crimping, than further north. Yeah, no, crimping is not it's all by itself. Designed for certain situations, it's great. Yep. It's yep. great, but but... You know, one of the things that happens to real organic projects, we're hearing from farmers all over the country growing all different kinds of crops. No-till works beautifully for ruminants on pasture. Right. Because there's no reason to till anything. Though most of them, though, you know, I mean, many pastures and most hay fields at a certain point could use a little tillage to achieve their potential. I mean, um, a hay, badly plowed, badly, you know, something that you inherit, that you start farming on that was misplowed, badly plowed, abused with a moldboard plow, can be improved and fixed with a moldboard plow. And um, so that's not no-till. I mean, they're, they're infirmity. There are things that are, well, and there are natural lays that are just, the reason that, that people have terraced mountains as long as people farmed, is that you can get a lot more off a terrace. 
then off. I mean, the physics is just against you when it's too steep, right. just to keep the fertility there. Right. Okay, so that prime, that's a big intervention, a terrace. Uh, and agricultural people, advanced agricultural people have always done it. They've always slowed the water down and kept it on the land longer. And that's tillage, you know, swales, all that stuff, key lines. That's all tillage. There is a reason why the farmers of generations coming up to us self-referenced as plowmen. Um, they were men, and uh, and and they that was the foundational craft for making milk, making vegetables, making whatever out of land was get it shaped right so the water moved appropriately across it, and it had the it would they they reference the, as part of the craft vocabulary was a land and opening a land and and uh, um, um, some people just didn't do it well. And one thing about having 200 families in a town like East Montpelier shipping milk is that you get to look at everybody. Everybody gets to look at everybody, farmer thrifty, farmer slack. You get to see the impact of really good bottom land compared to, you know, you get to Woodbury and the barns, the barns were built by farmers as best they could. You get down here in the Winooski, they were built by shipwrights, you know, coming up here during a recession in shipbuilding and building barns for people who could pay a lot of money because they had grass. The money came from grass. In this part of Vermont, grass was really made people rich. Uh, so not in Woodbury, <laughs> but, but in East Montpelier. Uh, so the soil tells on, you know, I mean, it, uh, and we, we as a society are now so far removed from any direct experience about soil affecting the prosperity of a family into generations, you know. Uh, and Vermont is a place where there are, there are small, great natural lays of arable, few, and mostly land that does not do well under tillage. And we have some small, so we're actually in a good place, a good landscape to look at tillage and its impact over time, if you can see it. I mean, some people can walk around the woods and see where the wall is, where the plowing happened, the shape of the land. And you can actually get an inkling of who did a better job than others. Uh, um, all right, I'm sorry, you're supposed to be running this conversation. Yeah, no, we're good. I wanna go on to regenerative in a moment. Yeah. I just wanna, before we do it, I wanna ask that question one more time and see what answer we get now. We've covered a lot of ground. so is organic regenerative and and let me amend that question to say is organic as you think of organic not not i'm not talking about the certification the usda definition what i mean meant when yeah. i said i'm i'm a, i'm gonna be an organic farmer that's what i do is absolutely regenerative it would there will be more fertility more potential more organic matter in any farm i mean that leave it better stronger healthier than you found it was definitely part of the ethic of what we meant by organic and also produce very wholesome food that would provide health to the animals or people that that ate it uh, uh, and that was right from get that was a foundational that 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 any lands that you operated on should be more farmable, more productive when you were done than when you started, um, and um, yeah. And All right. So now let me ask you the second question: Is regenerative organic? And I'm going to plead. You know, I'm a civilian without a. a, a, a full understanding of what everybody means when they say regenerative, even though I do listen and pay attention. But I know that that regenerative can include a pretty toxic assault on the environment in, in the current nomenclature. So, uh, and sort of mainstream chemical no-till practice is a good example. It seems to me um, really violative of the organic 
principle and and my concepts of regenerative to do large scale chemical killing of of plants uh, because of the con we know there i mean that there are a lot of consequences to the ecology of using most of those things and you know i, I have a very interesting argument about glyphosate lately uh, which is maybe not the worst of the chemicals that you know i mean there's always something worse so if you want to start talking about how hazardous is glyphosate compared to atrazine well you'd really rather your neighbors were using glyphosate okay then a lot of atrazine if you're drinking the water that's there's pretty good science about that uh do you want the guy who provides wheat to your baker to kill the wheat and dry it down with glyphosate uh, i don't want that on my in my wheat that i'm going to eat do i have really good science to say no you really mustn't do that i mean how could it even be legal I don't, you know, glyphosate bread breaks down pretty quick. Uh, the daughter products are, well, I mean, you know, again, uh, I, I, I have a very extreme emotional response to that practice, but uh, I, and I've delved into the science recent, lately because, and before, but more again lately because of the fact that so much straw used in bedding is in the north of Kansas is, is, is killed that way. And what are the impacts on using the manures that are bedded on those composts in, on, on those beddings, uh, on those straws in compost making? And glyphosate comes up as an issue because it's utilized for that purpose. Uh, and so then, then do you not use any manure that has straw that was harvested that way and that leaves out a lot of manure that then can't be utilized and back to the whole thing about the original understanding about organics was not that we were going to prosecute a separate system on a separate planet we were going to engage on this planet with what there was here to engage with this whole question of whether all the manure in organic agriculture should come from organic agriculture and um, that is a somewhat naive point about just in terms of the mass balance stuff okay and the idea of organics was that we we're going to do um, we're going to operate in ways that improve the health of the system and we're going to recognize that the system has some very unhealthy things going on in it and we're going to engage and we're going to have to make all these decisions uh, and and frequently we're going to have to make them with imperfect i guess always we're going to have to make them with imperfect knowledge that's sort of the what separates the the human from the divine <laughs> in our understanding is the you know the the, the uh, what the divine is that which the mind of human cannot encompass so we we're actually doing things uh, composting is a one of those rubber meets the road places cuz it's all about stuff in order to make compost you have must manage actual stuff that has calories it's not an abstraction you don't hit send and make more it's it's stuff and it has to come from somewhere and it's got to go somewhere and being stuff it has a history of things that happen to it so every every manure pile has a biography as as does every farm and those things matter and any of us are I, you know, understand the work we, I do, we do as sort of a chapter in a farm biography, uh, for better or for worse. Um, and, and so one of the things that we hope informs our decision making is the intention to make a better, more sustainable, more regenerative, healthier farmscape uh, by all of our practice. So do we decide to pour concrete or lay asphalt if we need traffic ability, or do we utilize other means that could be more readily, in, in the case of 
compost pads be returned to productive photosynthesis because one of the things about our compost making is that we take land out of photosynthetic production. And, and we do that, we've always recognized aspects of farming that do that. So barnyard is, take, takes it out of photosynthesis. And I, I think uh, uh, going forward, uh, the question needs to be asked in any farming system when you, that, that there needs to be a set of descriptions of reasons to remove a parcel from photosynthesis for some period. And in the case of making compost pads, we have a policy that we're, we're going to do things that can then be returned, readily be returned to photosynthetic activity. Um, and that we're going to inform our, uh, so, so we're going to use uh, particular crushed mineral materials that can readily be torn up and turned into hayfield. And we actually, in, in our own corporate history, have returned compost facilities to photosynthetic use and improved them in the time they spent as withdrawn from photosynthesis. And, you know, back to, I, I say photosynthesis a lot. It's a touch word because it, it should, it's the only way we get energy into the soil. It's the, it has to be the, the linchpin of, pro, of, of, of soil health support is fo ultimately photosynthesis and the amount of time you utilize it. So, uh, yeah, so it's, we, it, we got to keep going back to the, 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 the primary organization of the world we inhabit is that plants are the, man, are the primary managers of soil by this extraordinary capability they developed to remunerate other communities with sugar by, from the sunshine. And that, so plants are, I mean, we have to set up structures where plants build soils because all of the soils, all of our oxygen came from photosynthesis. The, the decision by cyanobacteria and uh, to, to do that. And, and this vinyl siding, I very, very hopeful because I'm suddenly finding a place where lichen is growing on this vinyl <laughs> siding. And I watched them take the shingles off this and put vinyl siding on it. And this is six or seven years ago. And Tim already was telling me I would, needed to buy the farm and he wanted to sell me the farm. And I said, Tim, you're taking the shingles off the house and putting vinyl siding on. It's not good for selling me the farm, right? He said, ha, 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 ha. You know, it's like, <laughs> but he was right. He died and she sold it to me anyway. <laughs> and now I've got lichen, um, you know, and so they are going to, the lichen is going to. Great. The lichen is going to save us, maybe. <sighs> yes. The beginning, the beginning of soil. C Carl, we should close soon. Yeah. But before we do, I want to ask you, um, what haven't I asked you that is important that I should have asked you? And why me? And why ask well, me? Um, well, obviously, the big, the big question is how do we get from here to any reasonable there? Uh, that would be a good question, and I. I, I, you know, I would say, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> I, the, I mean, that is obviously the, you know, like I, I talk to, I get a fair number of uh, college tours because we're, we're, we're doing a thing that interests some folks who, especially if, you know, it's not, it's many people have realized, okay, food is a really important subject that touches everything that humans, everything human. Okay, it's it's a point of access. So, no matter what people's political persuasion, eating is a thing that they probably want to do, and they care about whether their children get to do it, and they're the ones they, the people they care about, the community. And so I get a lot of twenty-year-olds, nineteen, twenty-year-olds coming around and talking about um, how do we make food for communities how do we have control over it how do we make sure it's healthy how do we know it has all this impact on landscape and climate and it comes back to this uh how do we repopulate it as an occupation thing and i say you know what are you're 20 i'm 70 
50 years between us, which is a working life, okay? You're embarking, I'm departing. What would be reasonable things for you standing here 20 years old today to aspire for the world, the community, when you're 70? What's a reasonable ask? This comes back to the, could we get 15% of y'all doing it full-time as a profession, not occasionally paying attention to it, but doing it full-time as a profession? Because when you work in things, you know things about them that you can't get any other way. Uh, and and this is part of the the social challenge. Is that And Vandana reminds us sometimes, Vandana Shiva reminds us that 70%, this is a couple of years ago when Trump got elected, was where she was using these numbers, 70% of the calories humanity consumes are still coming from small home. 30% by industrial means. And we're hitting a point where there will be no return if we exceed these numbers. And, and, and she was, she's big on the importance of actually having connection to the plant soil community through your hands and feet that that it's important to put your skin in the soil literally because there is intelligence and being vandana she goes to the latin she says intelligere to choose between things intelligence is good capable choosing between and and that the plant fungal system intelligence is accessible to smallholders that the plants and the soil communicate to smallholders better than they communicate to absent owners, shareholders, okay? <laughs> and that, that, that this connection is biologically urgent, sociologically urgent. And I, I guess I, I'm inclined to agree uh, that we, and, and we in the uber developed world where we think that your phone can actually produce lunch for you, it can. It shows up, right? And the tip is even done. But but we we I think we are at a crisis of mis of of confusion about the abstract and the caloric. You know, many of us are really, uh, and we we're easily distracted. You know, if we just if, okay, Tesla is going to say that's electric cars that fixes it. It's like no, electric cars are not going to fix things. And, and we're, of course, going to have to start out by making this, the wrong electric cars over, and, you know, a lot of them uh, and and trying to r continue this this really um, dead end uh, aspiration of 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 not having to do anything, hard, you know, <laughs> of not having <laughs> of not having to pay any serious attention. Aye, aye, aye. Anyway. All right. Right, we should, yeah. And I, I, I you know, I, I recognize that uh, this may not really be symposium material. Oh, thank you, Carl. No, it was actually, I enjoyed myself very much. Well, so I appreciate it. We've actually been in one way or another in this conversation for coming 50 years. A long time. Thank you for listening to The Real Organic Podcast. Our movement is growing because you're subscribing and sharing these podcasts with your friends. Keep it up and leave us a rating and a review as well. You can find a video version of this interview on our newly designed website, realorganicproject.org, or on our YouTube channel. Join us next time when we'll hear from the Churchtown Dairy Talks given by Elliot Coleman and Dave Chapman at the Saving Real Organic Conference in October. Dave is a world-class organic tomato farmer and co-founder of the Real Organic Project, and Elliot is Dave's longtime friend and mentor. Elliot is the author of seven going on eight books about organic farming and the founder of the famous Four Season Farm in Harborside, Maine.